I'm not just writing history. I am making it. I have the brain of a historian and the clapback of a comedian. You better come with sources because I always check footnotes. Welcome back to another episode of Historians on Housewives. I'm Casey. Max. I'm Jessica J. Mill, the millionaires. You know me, people. <laughs> <laughs> Someday we'll aspire to all of those extra names. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Yeah. <laughs> or not. Uh, Jessica could just have that. Shout yeah. out to Ricky Jones, the Ricky Jones radio show on iHeartRadio for helping me with some kind of handle. Mm. <laughs> so today we're going to take you to Washington, D.C. for really interesting discussions w- about the Real Housewives of Potomac and how that intersects with longer histories of African Americans in the greater D.C. area. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. We're going to cover topics of, you know, school education, segregation, blackface, uh, see how some of these things also tie into the Real Housewives of Atlanta. Uh, And if you know Washington, D.C., you know that, um, for decades up until the early 20th, early 21st century, it was known as Chocolate City, a haven for African Americans. But within the last 10 to 15 years, it has become gentrified, um, form- places that were formerly really um, lived in and embraced by African Americans, they are being pushed out. And that has changed in some ways the, 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 literally the color of D.C., but also it has produced some community problems. So as much as we're going to be talking about Atlanta and other places, we also are going to be talking about D.C. and the way that this particular scholar, uh, the way this particular scholar's work intersects really with some of the contemporary problems that are also going on in the nation's capital. So today's guest is scholar Takia K. Hamilton, and she holds a PhD in history from Princeton, an MA in African American Studies from Columbia, and a bachelor's in history from Dartmouth College. And she's taught at both the high school and college levels in several of the nation's most prestigious schools, including Princeton, Fieldston in New York, Poly Prep in New York, Sidwell in Washington, D.C., and the Latin School in Chicago, where she is currently located. Welcome, Dr. Takia K. Hamilton. Thanks for joining us on the show today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Would you like to start off by sharing your housewife's catchphrase with the audience? Yes. So my favorite catchphrase is, don't start none, won't be none. And that is, of course, um, by Candy Burris in The Real Housewives of Atlanta. Candy is one of, you know, the most iconic housewives of all time. I feel like that's a really solid tagline catchphrase to go with. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So you came to the housewives in search of an outlet from graduate school. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the importance of having that kind of space to take time away from researching and how the housewives maybe have given you a fresh look at your work or maybe how they've revitalized your energy for the various projects that you work on? Sure. Um, So I can't necessarily say that the housewives have given me a fresh look at my work. However, I would say um, having come to the housewives first uh, through my, while I was um, studying under my doctoral program at Princeton, um, it definitely was important to have a show like this um, as an outlet away from the, um, I guess, the intellectual rigor of the, the program. So I actually started watching um, my, probably my first year of, no, I think it was my second year of grad school. I didn't have cable. So I actually, uh, when I used to go to my boyfriend's house at the time, he actually put me onto the show, believe it or not. Uh, the Real Housewives of Atlanta, Basketball Wives, and also Love and Hip Hop. Um, I, in my second year, when I actually sat for my comprehensive exam, and as you can imagine, 
Um, as you know, that's a very difficult time, very stressful time. So to have something like this show um, and the other shows was a great source of relief from the intellectual work that I was doing. Uh, I would probably say initially it was, I saw it more, it was a guilty pleasure that I probably didn't broadcast to the world because um, academics are not supposed to be into shows like this. Uh, but I soon found that there were a number of people who actually enjoyed watching the shows for uh, similar reasons. So over the years, I pretty much have expanded to watch different, um, the different, um, different series um, with uh, the Real Housewives of Potomac, um, and then also with the Basketball Wives of LA, Miami. I also watch um, Married to Medicine now as well, and then of course. Um, the different love and hip hop shows. I think that just having that time to kind of re reset um, and just to kind of, um, you know, just have that the time away from the demands of the academic uh, work is really important for anyone. So um, we talk a lot about self care now, but I think that um, in many ways, um, this probably for me represented an example of um, self care at, at the time, and and just kind of now I've got I guess I've just become addicted to the show. So, um, but I did note that I haven't invested any real time in watching any of the shows that do not center Black women um, and families, and that's just um, particularly because I mean there's a lack of representation of women of color and particularly Black women on um, TV overall, and so um, when I turn, I mean, there are a number of shows I could watch um, and that I do watch that focus on mostly on uh, white families, um, but to be able to have these shows that capture the experiences of uh, black women um, is really important to me. So, And one of the things that you brought up about how at first it was kind of secretive and now you're starting to realize that a lot of other academics are really into the housewives is really resonant with our experience too in a lot of ways. Um, I feel like now it's kind of our conference icebreaker when we are meeting and greeting people for the first time. Hello, do you like Bravo? What's your oh, sure. <laughs> and it's actually, sure. it's been a kind of a great icebreaker and I've been amazed at how many people in academia are really grabbing on to various Bravo shows as this kind of outlet. And it's interesting too, because I think Max in particular is kind of doing his PhD in part because of the housewives. Oh yeah. I got into my doctoral program because, um, during my first icebreaker with the, um, professor who had become my advisor, um, we talked all about the Real Housewives of Orange County. And oh, wow. <laughs> Beverly Hills, yeah. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with the project you were interested in. You just no, I actually, in the No, I had to change my project. And your time period. And my time period. I was studying mm -hmm. 20th century private mercenaries, um, mm -hmm. and this professor works on colonial America. And so they mm -hmm. said, like, you know, if you crank it back a few centuries, like, I would be thrilled to take you on. So housewives can work mm -hmm. to your advantage, even in the academy. <laughs> well, I think, sure. one, I think one of the things that housewives does, right, going back to this guilty pleasure, I'm probably one of the only people who very early on said, I need this, right, um, and was very forthcoming about, you know, the shows I watch. But I think one of the things it does is it actually gives yet another layer of community to our to our academic lives without being overly intellectual about this. I think it sure. gives us, in some ways, a common language. Um, so I know a lot of, um, you know, again, African-American um, scholars gravitate towards Potomac and um, Atlanta. I gravitate towards Orange County only because really I live here. Beverly Hills is not necessarily my favorite <laughs> franchise, but I watch mm -hmm. it because, you know, locationally, I mean, I'm very familiar with, um, you know, kind of the Hollywood lifestyle. So I think what's become a guilty pleasure is really in some ways, you know, giving rise to all these other interesting conversations. 
Sure. I mean, I would add to that just in terms of the layer. I mean, for me, um, a, a great deal of my time in grad school and, and just even after was spent isolated. And so even having a platform like, you know, Facebook, where, you know, you soon find that other people are interested in the same thing. And, you know, you can just, um, you know, you spend time talking about some very serious issues, but also um, there are moments when you, um, you know, you find that someone else is, uh, you know, feels the same way I do about Candace, for example, <laughs> or, or uh, you know, any of the other uh, women on the show. So um, I think that for me, um, I would I would say yes, what you just said was, was correct um, in the sense that it, it allows, um, you know, it uh, sort of serves as a, as a base for people to connect around a whole host of issues. And I, I think, I mean, even some of the, the issues that, that are raised on the show um, that can actually be quite serious at times, um, I think gives us just one other outlet to, to connect um, beyond the, uh, or across the work that we're doing. So. so with all the shows that you've watched and, and the many seasons that we've had, have you, do you have your own favorite Bravo liberties and who are they and why? Um, sure. So, I um I mean this this is, is, is and in some ways is a, a difficult question because I think that with probably with the exception of I guess Candy and um, Robin um, a lot of the housewives I kind of go back and forth with um, whether or not they're my favorite whether or not I'm rooting for them whether or not um, you know they're sort of uh, you know they're sort of getting on my nerves at the moment but I think that um, I, I would say first and foremost would be Nene Leakes. Um, because I think, I mean, obviously she's been there from the very beginning. Um, she's been able to, uh, successfully, successfully capitalize off of her appearance on the show. Um, but she's also a very complicated person. I think that, um, you know, there are definitely times where I've rooted for, for Nini. And I think that some of the, uh, I mean, for instance, now with what's happening with her husband, with Greg, the hardship that, you know, that she's endured, um, just in, even in terms of her background, um, where, you know, she could have been judged for being a stripper, um, that she's done a lot on the show. Um, however, there are just times when she seems to be operating with a mean girl mentality. She seems very possessive with her friendships, and um, she's often at the center of a lot of mess on the show. Um, but I think that because of her complexity, I just tend to find her, uh, I find her to be one of the most interesting cast members uh, out of all the shows that I watch. Uh, I think that she is someone who in many ways has really just helped to make the franchise. I mean, just in terms of the language that, that, you know, we have sort of, um, uh, that she's uh, originated, that has resulted in, you know, just people just sort of using it in broader culture. Um, just, you know, uh, I mean, Nini in many ways is the the, um, the epitome of, in a, uh, of a housewife uh, in terms of the franchise. And let's not forget, she also is married. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are so many other housewives that there are housewives in name only and uh, aren't even married. And so I think that um, for that reason, I really, really uh, find um, Nini uh, uh, interesting. My other favorite, as I mentioned before, is Candy Burris, just in terms of the way that she's really used this show. I mean, she branched off from a music career. If you had asked me even, you know, 15 years ago to name any of the members of Escape, I probably wouldn't have been able to tell you their name, although I know the group, um, you know, I know their music. Um, but the fact that she's been able to branch off of that and actually really build an empire, I think, to me, is quite uh, compelling. Um, but what I like about Candy the most is that she seems she seems the most authentic out of all of the housewives. And uh, at no point do I get the, the impression that she's trying to represent herself as something that she's not. So, for instance, if Mimi is one to really sort of brandish you know, her fame and the fact that, you know, quote unquote, I'm rich, bitch, um, <laughs> her, you know, sort of favorite tagline. 
uh, Candy is in some ways, um, you know, she's some in some in many ways kind of understated. Uh, her importance um, understated, but I like the fact that she's a businesswoman. But at the same time, if you push her, um, she's just you know she's not afraid to to take it to the street. Uh, and I really really love that uh, about uh, Candy. And also um, the fact that you know she owned the fact that she wants you know she wanted a family, she wanted marriage, she made that a priority. Um, I know that there have been you know, some eyebrows raised in terms of her choice of a partner, the fact that he wasn't operating at her level financially, but uh, you know, she seems to just, I mean, decide that that's what she wanted to do, and she made it work for her. Um, I would say that I do sometimes feel a little uneasy about the relationship that she has with, with her mother, uh, Mother Joyce, because she seems to, her mother seems to, I don't know, walk all over her at times, but um, I mean, she even took that and turned that relationship, the conflict in that relationship, into a business opportunity with her um, theater show uh, and also the OLG restaurant. So, I mean, Candy is just, for me, um, really uh, one of my favorite, if not my favorite, um, cast member. And then um, most recently, I would say Robin Dixon um, is another favorite uh, because she also seems to represent one of the most authentic cast members on that very difficult show, that show where (laughs) in many ways everyone seems to be wearing a mask to some degree. Um, I would say Robin um, seems to be the most uh, authentic. She's been upfront about her financial hardships, her marital problems, um, and despite the fact that um, it's not clear whether or not her current relationship is helping to empower her, um, she doesn't seem to at all be performing simply for the the cameras. And um, I mean, even in, for instance, this, this um, one of the most recent episodes where she really didn't want to, I guess, broadcast the facts of, or I guess the alleged allegation, Ashley's husband uh, was, I guess, trying to grope someone or made this comment about <laughs> giving um, fellatio to someone's husband. Um, she really did not want to, um, to to go public with that, but she was sort of forced to do so by Giselle, who is also always at the center of a lot of mess. So I think that uh, I write like Robin for that reason, and I think it's really interesting because that show, The Real Housewives of Potomac, has often been critiqued for I guess, a sort of a, a large focus on light-skinned women and the fact that uh, Robin is biracial does bring up some interesting questions about are important, but uh, I still tend to like her. Well, let me back up. Let me just say that when um, I heard about Real Housewives of Potomac, people said, you're a scholar of Maryland and D.C. What do you know about Potomac? I said, this looks like nothing I work on. And then other Mm -hmm. people in these, you know, very elite free black communities or historically free black communities um, in the area said, no, that's pretty much accurate. So I'm thinking about the beige, beige aristocracy. I'm thinking about, you know, the ways in which there's these trappings of um, gentility. And then, of course, this is all like Potomac, Maryland, and how that's very Southern. So that also takes on a different, um, to play on words, hue. Um, can, you, can we just back up a little bit and talk, talk about Potomac and some of these masks the women may be wearing? I mean, obviously, all of this is kind of open to interpretation, right? Um, and just, you know, as a note, I did live in the D.C. area for six years. And I think that in some ways they are, they do kind of represent some of what I've seen, um, you know, play out in that, that area. But I think that um, probably, I think Karen Huger is probably a good example of someone to think about uh, when dealing with, this this notion that um, I guess the Potomac women they kind of represent um, I guess to kind of borrow from Phaedra like the sort of Southern belle uh, you know sort of the gentility of um, you know living a certain lifestyle and the way in which um, women are supposed to carry themselves I mean Karen she was supposed to be the sort of um, I guess for everyone kind of like the entry point into this 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 world oftentimes this world that a lot of people don't really know about this, this elite 
um, Black world. And so uh, what we've come to find out about Karen is that um, all that glitters is not gold, right? So, I mean, honestly, <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, I was watching the, um, an episode about a week ago, and I looked and I said, I feel like Karen has gotten lighter over the years. <laughs> and so I actually did a quick search for her image to try to see if, um, you know, if, if, uh, if I was correct. And what I noted was that it wasn't, I don't think that she necessarily has gotten lighter, but there's something about her peer, appearance that has changed. I mean, this is much the same with, I mean, you could probably say the same is true with any of the housewives. I mean, even Nene, but, um, but it seems like she's playing, she's been playing to a certain perception of what women in that area, what families, black families in that area are supposed to, um, represent. I mean, the whole thing with, you know, her husband calling him the, uh, what is the black Bill Gates, right? Um, so she's trying to kind of represent herself, um, as, you know, I guess the sort of epitome of this, um, uh, Potomac world, but um, you know she's had these financial hardships, um, you know, questions about like her taxes, and uh, I think that you can see even within her home life. I mean, there was speculation as to whether or not she was, you know, having an affair with someone else. Uh, I think that um, I think her 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 casting is in many ways emblematic of what I would. Probably, if I were to label someone's actions as an example of blackface, I would probably say that she would probably be one of the better examples. Um, I think what's interesting now is to have Candace on the show now, which she is my least favorite cast member of all times, I would say. And in some ways, it's almost like she's trying to adopt similar behaviors as Karen or even the other women that she sees to kind of to fit into this world. Um, but there is nothing, there's absolutely nothing about her with probably, with perhaps the exception of her mom seems to have to come from, um, well, she's established herself as uh, upper middle class, um, but there's nothing about her life that really kind of fits what we would imagine um, elite black families um, to look like in that area. And so, um, just every week that I watch her, um, she just seems to be, to me, the least authentic, trying to portray uh, what she believes is the appropriate perception of what, um, you know, the African-American elite uh, represented in that area. But I would say that, I mean, honestly, I would say, I mean, I talked about Robin Dixon. I would say she's probably the only one that I feel that is not doing that to a great degree. I mean, you have... Um, Katie on the show, you have Giselle. Um, I mean, they're all trying to not necessarily, not the sort of nouveau riche of the, the Atlanta series, but um, as families that have been long established. I mean, Giselle with her connections to, um, with her father to civil rights activism. Um, I think that, um, I think in many ways, they, they, each of them are kind of playing a role. But to the extent that I'm familiar with the history of that that area, mostly D.C., um, and also my experiences there, I would say that <laughs> they, they, they are, in many ways, um, their behaviors are reflective of what I've often seen of people who live in those areas, with the exception that those people are tend to be more private. They wouldn't necessarily publicize um, what they're doing. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, again, I mean, there's sort of many ways to kind of interpret it, but um, I think that show is is really probably one of the best examples of people really trying to play a particular role, um, a specific role for um, public, what they believe would be interesting for public consumption. So can we maybe do a deeper dive now into the history of... DC and some of these intersections that continue to play out in the show. So um, here I kind of want to dig in to the article you wrote, The Cost of Integration, um, which addressed, um, you know, the history of the Washington, D.C. school board's um, funding to white and black schools when separate but equal was the law of the land. And 
I feel like your article brought up um, conversations of respectability politics, notions of what was good citizenship for African Americans. And I was wondering if you could explain these things and kind of um, tell us about how this worked historically as you discuss in your article but also how we continue to see things like respectability politics play out on a franchise like Potomac okay um so I my project um the cost of integration so this article the cost of integration stems from a larger project a book project that looks at the efforts of African Americans to achieve uh, equality of educational opportunity in Washington DC um from the years of the, um, the well, really the sort of post-emancipation period, uh, when Congress established D.C. Um, education, public education in D.C., with possibly the, in, the intent of um, establishing, uh, establishing the school system as an integrated school system, um, the radical reconstructionists. Uh, but then um, D.C. became overrun by racist, uh, Southern uh, congressmen who maintain a separate but equal school system, what they believe is a separate but equal school system, um, in much in as much the same way as the 17 states that practice uh, legal segregation, uh, up through the um, the years right before Brown, um, the project um, one of uh, central sort of argument um, that um, the project kind of Looks at is the degree to which African Americans actually um, desired an integrated school system, and so this um, article really kind of looks at the efforts of one leader, uh, Garnett C. Wilkinson, um, who was the superintendent of the Black superintendent of schools for thirty uh, something odd years. He actually was a leader in the public school system for nearly fifty years. Um, his de- decision to promote, continue to promote a separate, a truly separate, um, but equal system, um, because he feared that African Americans would lose, uh, political autonomy and that they would, um, be, uh, have, uh, even greater difficulty, uh, availing themselves of the, uh, of opportunities in an e- evolving economic, um, uh, uh, structure in um, D.C. And so um, the cost of integration, which really is is this notion that integration would undermine any potential that African Americans had to um, to gain uh, political power um, in D.C., especially as whites were continuing to move out of the district and the district became by the um, well, by the 1950s, um, the public school system became predominantly black, and then by 19, 1960s, I believe, in 1957, um, it became a DC became a predominantly black city. So that really is what the the, the, the crux of the, the article is about. I mean, what what do we what do we potentially lose as a result of integration? And in DC, um, Garnett Wilkinson sort of had the vision that in um, Places like, for instance, um, the Howard area, so the Shaw area, um, that was really kind of the, um, it was the center of black economic activity uh, prior to Brown, that this was something that African Americans needed to sustain and that the public um, schools there by remaining separate, by focusing on a particular type of education. So rather than a comprehensive education, but on um, industrial skills and technical training that they would be able to take advantage of opportunities in the, um, in the evolving economic structure. So, um, so that really is, is what that was about. So I think that um, the degree to which um, respectability politics plays out in D.C. I mean, this is, I mean, anyone probably with any a uh, small degree of familiarity with uh, DC history can probably pinpoint different examples of how this played out. But um, I think um, what was interesting for me in the research on that article about Ernest B. Wilkinson um, is uh, I think in many ways he kind of epitomized uh, what you might find or what you might label as respectability politics in DC. So 
um, this is a note I think it was really kind of interesting when I was conducting my research and someone, a relative of uh, Wilkinson, uh, actually said to me, uh, when writing about DC history and when writing about Wilkinson, um, that it was important that I make sure that I make black people look good. <laughs> and so um, I think that in some ways speaks to this, uh, I guess, enduring, um, uh, I guess, um, enduring um, mindset among African Americans uh, in DC, where there were many elite Black families that were had um, been established since the post Reconstruction period. That um, this kind of represented the crux of elite society um, um, nationwide. Uh, I think that with Gar Garnett Wilkinson, what's really interesting is, um, as I kind of mentioned this to you. Um, it kind of remind, reminded me in some ways of what we see playing out on Potomac and the other shows. Um, as I got, um, dug deeper into the research, I found that um, Garnett Wilkinson actually had this moment where earlier on in his career where he was accused of pulling a knife on a woman that he had had. In a, apparently, he was having an affair with this woman and she had helped him. She loaned him money. Um, to um, for school and he didn't repay her and she shows up at Dunbar High School, um, which is a place um, where Wilkinson actually taught and he also was principal for um, a number of years. Dunbar also again, um, in many ways, the epitome of that elite elite society in DC. Um, she shows up at Dunbar and she demands her money back and she claimed that. Um, he pulled a knife on her, cut her, and then he actually wound, winds up being arraigned in court. And this was this really a footnote in um, uh, research that I was doing, but I thought it was really interesting because what happened was um, the D.C. school board, they really wanted Wilkinson to serve in this position, a position that they actually created for him, particularly because they believed that he wouldn't he wouldn't ruffle any feathers. He wouldn't really challenge the status quo. Um, that they actually sought, um, sought, sought effectively to kind of to make sure that this didn't get out to the, the broader public that he had been engaged in this. But I just thought this was interesting because this was a, a, a man who, throughout all of my research and throughout the history that I looked at, he was he all he was um, he prides himself on being this kind of polished well-spoken, um, someone, a uh, man who, someone who could get along with white people, um, even segregationists. And you have this example of something that's very scandalous um, incident um, that uh, that he attempted, he and the school board attempted to cover up, um, I think in some ways speaks really well to, um, you know, this notion that of respectability and and how ha black people have to represent themselves in order to uh, gain a particular um, standing among white people. Um, but this was true across the board in many of the elite circles in DC, many um, residents who were tied to the NAACP, um, how it was the, NAA the center of uh, NAACP activity, Northwest DC particularly, um, so another thing that I look at in my broader work are some of the class tensions um, that are actually reified um, through the different approaches that residents from various corners of D.C. Uh, pursued. So residents that live, for instance, in the Northeast and um, parts of the Northeast, Southwest and Southeast, which is where more poorer classes of Blacks resided, um, how they kind of viewed members of the NAACP, many of whom who actually lived in the, the Northwest, um, they felt that oftentimes they, their objectives were at odds with um, what the media interests of the um, residents that lived in these poorer areas. And so oftentimes you would see them kind of just speaking out and saying, you know, pretty much to hell with <laughs> the social mores of the Black elite and really kind of pursuing their, their own agenda apart from on these more elite circles. All right, so now it's time for our Historians on Housewives game break. So today we're going to play 
um, what I like to call historian's hot take and our bunko party section, which um, is going to be kind of this lightning round take on some Bravo news. So my first um, news story that I'm going to throw out to you guys that you can weigh in on is Kenya Moore is returning to the Real Housewives of Atlanta, and she just recently met up with Portia so that their daughters could have a play date. What are our thoughts on this changing relationship and the return of Kenya? I think that it's great that Kenya is returning to the show. She's a hot mess, but she adds a lot to the show. I think that I'm really happy that she and Portia are attempting to become friends but I would probably give it another year before their kids are fighting each other over some issue. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica? Meh. Meh. I'm not really Meh. feeling it. But if we were always attuned to what comes next, what the next um, franchise is going to be, why don't we put Portia, Kenya, and Phaedra with Mr. President and Mr. Vice President and have all the kids interacting. Why don't we make it just, I forgot about Ace. Andy, you owe me some money for that spinoff idea. This next story had my head super spinning. I still can't make sense of it. So Dog the Bounty Hunter's wife, Beth, recently died. And Real Housewives of alum Kim Fields was supposed to kind of produce, coordinate this memorial service at their church in Aurora, Colorado. And it, On top of that, Captain Sandy from Below Deck Med, her girlfriend was supposed to be one of the singers at this service. So what do we make of this really bizarre, fascinating reality TV crossover and all of these implications that it raises? My take on this has nothing to do about the way in which religion can bring us all together or that race relations in Colorado are wonderful, that Dog the Bounty Hunter has said the N-word before, and now this predominantly African-American church may or may not be hosting the, the service. I think that Kim Fields is brought in strictly to be a producer. She's a working woman. She's working woman in Hollywood. I think that's the end of the conversation. The only person I know in that equation is Kim Fields. Again, I don't really pay attention to these other shows. <laughs> I know Kim Fields. She had a really tough time the one year she was on that show. So I can't really see that she's attempting to do anything that will bring her back on any of these shows. But perhaps, I don't know, maybe she's interested in doing something else. Cool. So this brings us to our last question in Historian's Hot Take. And again, we can be a little bit more intensive with this one um, because we're going to segue back into um, our interview segment. And this will set us up for our next discussion. So Candace Dillard recently on an episode of Potomac threw a butter knife at Ashley Darby. And she ended up taking a lot of heat for this on social media. And Candace argued that the response she was getting from fans was actually the outcome of colorism. So what is colorism? How do we understand this event in a longer sequence of violent conflicts across Potomac and Atlanta? Was this an issue of colorism? Was this about a certain level of intensity in this heated exchange? Um, Was it about the throwing of a butter knife or is is it a combination of things? Well, I guess the first question is, I mean, this is not definitely going to take more than 15 seconds, but um, was she saying that the colorism, so how did she, how was she characterizing the colorism that she felt was being directed towards her? I mean, were people actually saying things about her skin color or she just feels internally, I mean, she just feels that um, she was um, being um, targeted specifically because she's one of the darker skinned women. on Exactly. The show. She was like oh, the reason people are so upset with me is because I'm the darkest cast member on Potomac. So it's, it's, it's the result of colorism um, that they're mad at me, that like it wasn't that bad. I shouldn't have this level of heat, but I'm getting it because I'm, um, I don't look like the other, like my other castmates on Potomac. I think it was also related to a few other incidences that we haven't discussed yet, like the Amistad conversation, the butter knife conversation. So Candace came back to answer all these tweets saying, "Mm, 
I think it's really interesting that these things are being pointed out, and I just happen to be, um, you know, the darker cast member. And, and really, I don't know if Candace said it first. I remember someone else tweeting saying, hmm, do we think this is colorism? And so I don't remember the course of events, but basically it's now on the table if she is being treated differently based on colorism. Yeah, I wish you could actually see my face grunting up right now. Um, well, first, 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 I actually, there was a moment before all this happened with the Amistad um, comment and the butter knife that I wondered if, if in some way the show was playing to um, those, I guess, tensions um, with kind of setting Candace up as someone to be, I guess, um, despised in terms of her behavior, given the fact that she she currently is the darkest member on the show. Um, who was the other woman that was on before her? Um, the one that was it. Mo- was her name Monique? Are you talking about the one that was married to uh, not Monique? Who was married Monique, to no. the University of Maryland coach? Yeah, that that guy. I forget her name. <laughs> She was married to the University um, I mean, of Maryland uh, basketball yeah. coach, but I don't remember her name. Yeah. Yes, that's the one I'm talking about. Um, Katie? But, I mean, no, no it wasn't Katie. Uh, oh, she, she, the one uh, that had the big, um, like, champagne closet that she had made? Yeah, yeah her. Right, I don't remember um, her name. I'm forgetting her name. We will but, edit in her um, name. Sure. I mean, I can look it up really quickly. Uh, <laughs> you want me to look it up? Um, no, I can look it up because I'd rather have you focus okay. on actually, you know, unless you kind of understand how skin politics works, um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily be able to understand, you know, what is going on or if they are setting it up like this. So I would have, rather have you talk about just kind of, te- let me let me push, why is your face scrunching up? Is it the same reason my face scrunched up? Is this a taboo topic? I mean, what should we be t- what should we be saying right now, like you and I, for a larger audience? Well, my face is not scrunching up because it's a taboo topic. I mean, this is something I write a bit about, especially if I'm focusing on DC and my work. Um, my face is scrunching up because, again, um, Candace is one of my least favorite members uh, of any of these franchises, and I believe that um, Candace to me is a very entitled, self-entitled individual who, um, I mean, she represents herself oftentimes as being um, in some ways, I guess, above other people. And and so the fact that she's now kind of falling back on colorism as a crunch, crunch, I'm sorry, as a a crutch, mm-hmm. um, I think in some ways is a disservice, um, does a disservice to just even that that history of a, re- a very serious issue um, in African American communities. So that's the reason why my face is front. Okay, up. so you're you're basically saying you you know you might be a whack personality. So why are you trying to default now to colorism? Some of your actions yes, exactly. are, and, and I agree with you. Like I agree with you that you know you just might be. I mean, the kids don't say whack anymore, but. Um, you just might be an unpleasant person, and so now you're gonna rely on they hate me because of no. It just you just might be an uh, I don't want to say you're an awful person. I don't know Candace, but I will say that on every household franchise, there's mean girl behaviors, and mm-hmm. you know, again, I don't want to say that I don't like her, but at the same time, she is one of my least favorites too. Sure, I mean, I don't think. I mean, you know, I just. I mean, I just spoke at length about. Uh, Candy, you know, she's my favorite cast member of all time. And I don't really see people, um, I don't see being her, I don't see her being, you know, attacked in any way um, like that. Um, I guess the difficulty is in the show, like the the Potomac show, um, there aren't any other currently um, uh, women that are darker skinned women. Um, So maybe it sort of leaves some room open for that argument, but um, I think she's just she's stretching. She's she's reaching for. Do you think <laughs> she's, she's reaching. reaching for a storyline, or do you think she's just reaching? Yeah. Do you think she's reaching for a storyline? I think she's just reaching. Just reaching. Um, point. Yeah. Of, okay. Uh, sorry. Sorry to cut you off. 
Point of clarification, we were talking about Eddie Jordan. He was the husband of Sharice Jordan. Oh, yeah, Sharice. And, and he, he was the Rutgers um, coach. I mm. conflated him with Juan, who's now, isn't he now coaching for one of the University of Maryland teams? Not the Terrapins, yeah. but one of the, one of the other University of Maryland campuses, um, I think. Yeah. So we were talking about um, Sharice yeah, Jordan. Yeah. So, yeah, my point in bringing her up is that, um, you know, I, she she seemed to fit right in with the show, so I don't <laughs> I don't see where that would be an issue that, uh, for for Candace. Right, the fact that she wasn't blonde, she didn't have blue or green eyes, and she mm-hmm. you know medium medium brown. She but she fit in. So colorism, you think, eh, not not an appropriate not an appropriate stick man at this point. Not not for Candace. Now, in terms of their choices. For the show representation, that yeah, yeah. I mean, we can have a, we can definitely have a conversation about that. But in terms of their friendship circle, mm-hmm. maybe there's something to that, you know. But um, for Candace, no. Okay, now tell me how these some of these tropes play out on Potomac. Do they? No, no, not Potomac. Um, the relationship then. So, so if we have this issue with Candace, and you know, potentially another housewife that is been one of the more disliked is potentially Phaedra, right? So how are some of these things playing out when it actually is seen in the Atlanta context, right? What is this connection happening here potentially between Phaedra and Candace? Are you asking us all or or our expert guest? Our expert guest. Yes, for the expert well, guest. I mean, anyone else can start because I think I have to think about that one for a second. Okay. Um, and, and it doesn't have to necessarily be answered. I was just um, curious here that we have um, Candace trying to kind of find excuses for for behaviors um, or, or justifications why the behaviors um, – shouldn't be looked negatively upon. And then we have this figure of Phaedra who was axed from the show as another, you know, very contentious housewife who uh, did a lot of um, interesting problematic problematic things. (laughs) But I mean, the circumstances of her departure were very different. Oh, yeah. Um, And so, I mean, again, I think that, I think that, I mean, maybe, you know, um, Jessica can sort of second this. I think that those questions for, given, I guess, the work that I've I've done, those questions are always in the back of my mind in terms of how setting people up. Um, So even on the shows themselves, um, when the women are kind of describing each other, so for instance, um, you know, the the labeling of Kenya is this kind of like Jezebel type, that does kind of raise, um, you know, um, some eyebrows for me um, of whether or not that is kind of playing into that trope. Um, so definitely, that's always there. I'm not saying that that is not a question that that we shouldn't be shouldn't be thinking about. But I don't think that there are sort of I don't think there are any easy connections that can be drawn between um, those experiences. Because what I would want to know is then, okay, let let's kind of survey the women on this show and uh, and you know, if, if there were a, a, a pattern in terms of the way they feel like they were being treated or how they're being um, represented, then, then possibly we can have that conversation. But I mean, I just, I haven't heard that. Um, and I haven't really sort of witnessed that in any of the other women's experiences. So uh, I think that, um, again, I just, I think that that's just Candace just reaching, reaching for, for something to kind of justify the fact that um, that her behavior uh, up to now has been quite questionable. So moving then from Potomac more deeply into Atlanta, we have this issue of the fight between Kenya and Portia at the Atlanta reunion. And so kind of having this continuing conversation about kind of this consumption of violence what can we say about the way that black women are treated by Bravo and fans after these moments of violence? And um, one of the questions you actually had brought up is what is the culpability of Andy Cohen and the producers in moments like these? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, so I think that, I mean, I, I mean, I know that on the other shows they do, they fight. <laughs> and I mean, honestly, <laughs> you know, sort of full transparency, though I don't really watch those shows in great detail, I'm kind of happy when I see that they are fighting on these other shows because it, it then, um, you know, uh, we can't, with that in, in mind, we can't sort of pathologize black women alone, like, because we can point to these other examples of women who are uh, engaged in um, you know, this violent behavior across the board. Um, but I think that there is sort of taking these shows together, the Bravo shows, like um, uh, Real Housewives of Atlanta, uh, they really haven't been too much. Well, I mean, with, with the exception of the the, the butter knife on on Potomac, um, we've seen you know on Love and Hip Hop, which is popular among so many more people than I actually even imagined. Um, basketball wise, I mean, one of the reasons why people um, have been tuning into these shows is because of the violence, right? Um, it is something that gives people, you know, sort of something to talk about the next day. Um, so I think that um, they have been, I think these shows have been kind of playing on that because they feel like in many ways, this is what makes the show interesting. I think aside from the reunion um, example, I remember one of my other favorite um, sort of episodes to kind of think about is there's the one episode where the, um, there's like a pajama party and um, Candy and Peter and Nini, they're sort of all going at it. And this is one moment where Candy kind of just loses her cool. And basically, I mean, she says she, she will drag <laughs> one of the other women in the room. And I think that um, that is something that the producers, particularly Andy Cohen, I think they know that that is going to speak to a broad segment of people in terms of tuning into the show. So, I mean, do we feel guilty about watching these shows when this happens? Um, I would say, I, I would say yes. I mean, it's, you know, that's not something that, that we should be promoting or encouraging. But, um, I mean, in all honesty, I think that it's something that, um, that definitely draws people into the, these shows and makes them more interesting. I think that my initial sort of foray into some of these shows, particularly with basketball wise, had very much to do with that because I had never seen that before. It was something I had never seen <laughs> on TV before. Um, but when that becomes the thing that is the um, the driving force of the show, I think that's when we need to um, to really sort of think about what is what it is that we're consuming and what sort of images are we projecting um, to the world at large about just you know black women in general. So one of the things we did on, um, or a conversation that actually Max and Casey and I had, um, and this is totally off, off, off topic, but it isn't, is we were speaking about if we had our ideal um, kind of road rules team, if we went back to MTV and we drafted a, um, a cast uh, for road rules, which uh, reality, um, which Real Housewives franchise would you pit against one another? And I actually brought in, um, totally off script, I brought in the fact that we should actually have um, the Basketball Wives cast go against one of the Housewife cast teams because I do think that Basketball Wives brings that kind of element. So I'm just looking for a co-sign, Takia. Am I wrong thinking that this would be a great show? Basketball wise, think, and one of the fr housewife franchises doing road rules. I know that I definitely have had that thought before. <laughs> Could you imagine <laughs> Tammy? Right? Because you're thinking about Tammy. Tammy can right. do it. Evelyn. I mean, I mean, come on. Th I well, really you know, think you know, this would you, be great. You know the reason why I had that that thought because, um, uh, the basketball wise, they have a couple of bullies on that show. Big time bullies. Big time bullies, right? Especially Tammy, especially Evelyn, Evelyn at one time. I don't know if she's re completely reformed by now, but I don't think so. Um, and so I, I always wonder what it would look like for them as bullies to come up against someone like a Candy, right? Who, like I said, I don't, Candy's not walking around looking for trouble. 
But if you push her to the limit, she's, she, she's definitely willing to respond. And so I just, I guess what I'm saying is I kind of want the bully, the bullies to kind of get their just desserts. <laughs> what about Carolyn um, Manzo? That, do you watch, you do, do you watch real uh, New Jersey at all? You don't watch. No, the, I think we have really, Carolyn no. Manzo, who is actually the OG kind of um, behind the curtain kind of more boy. than Teresa Judice. No, because I think Carolyn has. I mean, I think Ter- Teresa is the in your face bully. Mm-hmm. But I think Carolyn has that hidden hand. She's smart. She's in the background. She her 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 moves are going to be decisive. Mm-hmm. I only say this because there's a reason she and her sister aren't getting along. Right. Mm hmm. Right, no, wait, she's sister-in-law's too. Jacqueline, is it? Is she sisters with Dina Manzo? Uh, yeah, she's yeah. related to Dina and Jacqueline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's a reason that something's not going on there. Anyway, I could see a total Jersey or Atlanta with road rules, but we have gotten completely off topic. I don't mind it, but I do want to give fair to I don't think too. so. I think that's a great question, because it really brings up, like, <laughs> you know, like, for instance, somebody like a Tammy or Evelyn, I mean, are they really just doing this for TV? Or, you know, as they say, like, if they were in the streets, like, <laughs> what would the streets say? <laughs> right, right. So, okay, so t- let's let's take it a little differently. Let's go to the, the Amistad conversation. We've kind of played over it a few times. Um, we've ran past it, but there's this moment where um, – was it Candace? Now I've Giselle is so much in the middle of all this. Was it Candace that said Katie looked like Amistad? Um, with her head wrapped? It was it was let's see. It was um Someone said that No, it was Monique. It was Mo- Monique. It was Mo- Monique. Monique. Okay. Right. She said it. So let's yes. set it up. So Monique made a comment. Well, we know that this particular season of Potomac, that Katie has had a variety of hairstyles. Let me just point that out. She's had some struggle <laughs> wigs, if we will. If we were to talk, take it real, real, she's had some struggle <laughs> hairstyles. But one mm-hmm. of the better ones, actually, I thought, is when she had her hair wrapped. And so mm-hmm. wrapped up in a scarf. But Monique said that she looked like Amistad. On one level, I thought, huh, there actually is a clip at the beginning of Amistad where some children are wrapped in headscarves and they're Mm -hmm. in prison. Huh. Someone else said, but what do you mean? Amistad was about freedom, right? Give us free. And then, of course, it comes down to the issue of black hair politics. So, Dr. Hamilton, what is your take on the Amistad controversy? My my initial thoughts about about it was that it was just kind of a one-off comment that where there really was no no sort of real harm intended. But the more I thought about it, again, you're you're right. It did bring to mind um, these sort of issues related to you know black black hair, black you know, politics, especially because across the board, I don't think on any of these shows. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there are any black women are, that are really wearing their hair naturally. You mean that's naturally think, their own hair and not a wig that's natural? I don't right, really think that right. anyone's wearing their head hair natural. I think you're correct. Right. And that I don't think natural. there there is and I don't think there is anyone who is with the exception of when they travel to Africa, because that's okay, right? Mm-hmm. Travel to Africa. <laughs> um I don't think that there is anyone who is even representing themselves in a what we would call a sort of Afrocentric way. So when you put it in that context, I do think that there are some issues that kind of speak to what their mindset, and particularly somebody like Monique, um, who is clearly to me a climber, a social climber, um, I think that speaks to a mindset among these women about what is seen as acceptable, classy, um, polished, right? as opposed to um, someone who, um, I mean, she, if she's, you know, I mean, who, who's wearing the wraps right now, the hair? I mean, it's a lot of um, black women who have, you know, you see with um, that they're fashioning their hairstyles in a lot of different ways. And, you know, they're wearing the big hoop earrings or, you know, they're just really kind of speaking to um, a, uh, a culture that is peculiarly, um, hours and, and you really just don't see that on any of these shows and so I think that it does 
it does in a way speak to the mindset of these women and what they think is think of as acceptable and who would actually fit on these shows. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't imagine myself to um, to fit on any of these shows because there's nothing about me <laughs> that I think that they would find um, acceptable in terms of the image that they're trying to represent to um, the larger public, um, whether or not it's with their, you know, their, the the longer weave hair or not to say that it's bad, but obviously because they all do it, there must be something to um, the way that they're thinking about um, uh, how they're representing themselves to the, the broader public. And I, and I, one thing I would add is the reason why I find some of these images troubling and the reason why I would find a conversation like that troubling is because I also know that there are a lot of young women, young black girls that also watch these shows as well. And so what is it saying to them um, when that is sort of the only image that they're seeing and when uh, anything that seems to be, uh, I guess, at odds with that um, is being critiqued in that way, I think that's when it becomes becomes a problem. I agree with you. I agree with you. So in um, in some ways to bring this all together, um, we've talked about this peripherally, but I want to um, play on words, integrate it more solidly into this conversation. We've talked about how race issues can be polarizing or, well, we haven't necessarily gone into all the ways in which race issues can be polarizing. We have the example on, of Atlanta um, where Kim was accused of, teaching, uh, of treating um, Sweetie inappropriately as a right. quote-unquote slave. Um, we can play right. with that. But I actually want to, I want us to think a little bit about what would it look like if we had an integrated housewife series? Uh, because I think they think that Atlanta was integrated because they had Kim, right? You have that one person no. who is my, my, I have black friends. Mm -hmm. Can we play around the, play with the themes of like integration or even accommodationists? Um, mm -hmm. What would an integrated series look like? Or do they already have integrated series and we should just leave that alone? And are there accommodationist storylines in, in some of these ha franchises? Obviously, it's going to work better if we talk about Dallas or, or Potomac or Atlanta because we're talking, you know, I mean, these are, you know, race issues. So I would just, you know, throw that out kind of the end of the ball game, see where it goes kind of question or questions. <laughs> The cost of integration, no. <laughs> right, this is a whole, a whole second or third episode. Cost of integration with housewives. Uh, I personally am not interested in an integrated series. Um, they never, I mean, the ones that I know about, they never seem to work. So in addition to the um, Kim being on Real Housewives of Atlanta, now I'm going to blank on this other, what is the woman's name? Um, there was a woman, a white woman who was on the first, season of uh, Potomac. Um, oh, let's look She was a cast member for about um, a year. I want to say um, something more articulate than old girl. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let's find out her name. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I, I honestly, I just didn't find their role. Um, I didn't find her role interesting. I thought that Kim's role to me um, in many ways, detracted from my interest in the show. Mm -hmm. I think that there are spaces that I I enjoy um, primarily because the focus is on Black women. And I think that, I mean, outside of the, the Bravo franchise, um, and this is a question that I've, I've thought about uh, with a number of other shows, I don't think that, especially when the show is predominantly Black, TV shows don't tend to do the white sidekick very well. Mm -hmm. I agree. Because you, you really get the sense that these are like token white people on these shows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the reverse, right? Um, and I mean, it's just, I don't think that there's room for death, um, there, or at least there hasn't been. Um, and so I just, I, I personally am not really that interested in a show that, unless it was, I would say maybe, maybe it was truly integrated. Mm -hmm. um make that would but then i'm a, I'm a little scared i'm a, a little scared about it because <laughs> what's going to happen if the the you know uh the tensions escalate and you know words are said and and hands are thrown 
<laughs> they're going to need all I, of I us on watch what ha- watch what happens live with Andy trying to de- uh, debrief and explain to everyone what has just happened and why it's problematic, right? <laughs> they're going to need right. like they're yeah. really going to need us. Well, and it's interesting yeah. because the the lineup for Potomac from season one, they don't actually have like a white housewife in that lineup. So I wonder if it was a friend of the show or someone who just had a few episodes, but season one of Potomac was so contentious over these, over the issue of castmates being biracial. Mm -hmm. Right. So I I think that that was uh, an important story arc, right. In a conversation they were continually having about, you know, what that meant within that space. And was, was it authentic blackness? Right. Or was it not? If you were to do a remake of Real Housewives of DC, which is actually my favorite franchise, who would you cast given your work? So I'm thinking of um, Descendants of Garnett Wilkinson. I'm thinking of Descendants of Kelly Miller um, from Howard or members of Congress, for example. Who would you cast in a, in a Real Housewives of DC? Um, just before I move to that question, I just want to make a correction. I realized that I, I aired, it was, um, that white, um, cast member, I think she was on the first season of Mary to Medicine. Oh, uh, her. <laughs> I don't know her name, but her. Yeah, yeah. Not to be confused yeah. with the LA Mary to Medicine cast, cast members right. where there's some this season that I think, mm, okay, you're talking about her whose name I don't remember. We can. We'll look right. that up. We'll, ed- we'll edit that in. We have a great editor. Um, okay. So, I'll, so um, t- take two. If you were to do a remake of Real Housewives of DC, who would you cast? So that's a really interesting question. Um, you brought up Garrett Wilkinson, um, Kelly Miller. I think anybody associated with the Howard brand uh, would be interesting. Um, I thought about um, the, uh, I mean, I, it, the descendants, I, I guess one of, um, I guess the question um, focuses on descendants because in some ways it's kind of imagining what it, what it would have been like with the, um, the uh, Wilkinson or Miller sort of as, as original castmates. And so that made me think about someone like a Lucy Dig Slow or, uh, um, uh, uh, Charles Hamilton Houston, you know, um, if they have any uh, descendants uh, sitting around, I think that would be kind of interesting. Uh, I especially thought about uh, Anna Julia Cooper. Yes, ma'am. I was thinking about uh, descendants um, of some of some club women and activists. Yes, ma'am. Tell us. Yeah. So, I think Anna, Anna Julia Cooper would be interesting because you know, going back to the whole sort of question of like early scandal, um, I think she would be someone who's really interesting because of some of the things that happened to her at Dunbar and um, in some ways her marginalization um, in DC, um, in DC circles, elite circles, um, I think would really kind of um, kind of speak to some of uh, the issues that we're currently talking about. Mary Church Terrell, (laughs) right? Um, (laughs) I think that that would be great. Um, But I just, you know, there are a number of what we would consider sort of more established DC families um, that we could um, add. I, for one, would love to see a show that crosses the class divide for DC. Mm-hmm. Okay. So okay. Yeah. So, you, so yeah. you're trying to so, stir up some problems. Let's let's. What would well, this look like? So okay. So one of the people I write about, um, his name is uh, Gardner Bishop, and he was a uh, parent. Um, his kids went to, um, uh, he were, uh, his kids were in the public schools in D.C. He lived out in the in Northeast D.C. His, um, he actually brought a case against the school board that um, predated um, maybe a couple of years before the Bowling v. Sharp, although he was very instrumental in um, helping to, to launch that case. Um, he is a great sort of counterpoint to Garnett Wilkinson um, because at every turn, he challenged him. He basically just said that Garnet Wilkinson was just operating on behalf of his own interests. I and again, he came from the North ECC, and he always wanted to kind of make a name for um, the residents who lived in those corners 
um, of the city who weren't well represented and who kind of like were um, in some ways I would say sort of in, intentionally overlooked by um, some of the more established families because they felt that they weren't, um, you know, that they weren't, I mean, a lot of these were actually also migrant families as well, that they didn't fit into the fabric of this sort of more elite um, culture. I would love to see his descendants or someone like that. Um, and especially from a, an area of DC that most people, I guess until recently, through gentrification, um, but the in areas that people just don't aren't familiar with. Because when you think about the history of D.C., most of what we point to is Northwest centric. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, in and around um, Howard. Um, but to kind of expand that and just kind of look at, you know, um, I mean, I um, in my research, I looked a lot at the uh, files of E. Franklin Fra- Frazier, who conducted, uh, you know, hundreds of interviews of residents who lived in these other corners of DC and his interviews covered everything from their opinions on sex segregation to um, uh, uh, sexuality and um, what they believe at the time was, you know, promiscuity uh, among teenagers. So to kind of add all those elements um, to a show to give you a different picture of, um, you know, the, the, the landscape in DC, I think would be really interesting. Okay, so let's talk about the landscape Lucy of DC. Did, oh, Lucy Diggs Flow too. I'm sorry. Can I just add that last one? Lucy too? Diggs Flow. So, right. So, so even beyond crossing the crossing the class divide. So, I mean, I think we've kind of accepted the fact um, now that Lucy Diggs Flow um, was um, uh, uh, lesbian. Who she had relationships with women, and um, so it'll be interesting to kind of like add that element as well. Um, to um, a show like, uh, you know, one focus on DC, but just any of the things that kind of like upset what we think about or what we sort of imagine the landscape in DC to look like, I think would be interesting. Excellent. This is my final question. And because this is not um, a, a history course where I'm supposed to be objective or, you know, it's more of an op ed that I want to bring you in on, I want to talk about the mute DC movement and what in some ways it can teach outsiders about D.C. So I've jumped ahead. I just got that look like you jumped ahead. Um, I have some specific questions about D.C. and gentrification, and I think it's fair game. So Mm -hmm. um, let me start by asking why you chose D.C. as a place of inquiry. Did the topic choose you, or did you choose the topic? Um, So actually, I'm glad you said, did it choose me? I think that's probably more appropriate to say that the topic chose me because I initially, so all of my research up until this point was largely focused on black women's history. So anything um, dealing with black women from slavery all the way up through the civil rights movement. Um, When I was kind of looking around for a topic, um, I knew that I wanted to do something um, related to education and initially, my my question had a lot to do with um, black um, black perspectives about education, and so um, really kind of interrogating uh, a lot of the scholarship that you know represents education as this kind of primary objective for African Americans, and how that sort of contrasts with um, the sort of growing sense of nihilism you begin to see. I would say mm, probably in a the decades following following Brown, um, but as I began to get deeper um, into the research, I decided that I wanted to do something. Um, so I was looking at. I actually started looking at New York. I looked at Chicago, New York, because I had lived there for a while. Chicago, because that's where I'm from originally, and I just happened to kind of poke around in um, D.C. at the advice of my advisor, and um, I just became so fascinated with the history of D.C particularly because D.C. is a federal city and all of the implications um, with that wrought. And so um, as I just got deeper into the subject matter, I just, it just felt like a place that was so, so rich, so complicated. And it was a set, an area that was relatively understudied. And um, the project allowed me to really I guess, challenge myself in terms of political history, ethnography, um, cultural history, legal history, because D.C. is not a state. And um, it really just kind of drew me in. So in that way, it chose me. And it's something that 
it just the place that just never bored me um, as far as the complexities that were um, uh, that were very apparent um, in trying to kind of unravel a lot of that stuff. So um, that's how I came to to, to DC, and I moved. Um, after a year, actually, uh, of conducting some preliminary research, I decided to move there, and I wound up living there for six years. Um, never went back <laughs> after that, except to to graduate. So um, that's how I got into um, that topic. Um, as far as um, gentrification, do you want me to kind of speak about that a little sure. bit? So, um, so. Having conducted so much research on DC and having been immersed in those archives and just understanding the way in which the city evolved, I guess in some ways gave me an insight, um, a little bit of a sort of unique in- insight to, into some of the, the things that were happening in DC. So um, I'm not sure if many people know this, but for up until Um, I would say the 30s, D.C. was predominantly white. Um, It was about a 70 to 30 percent ratio between uh, white residents and black residents. And then beginning in the late 30s, early 40s, around World War II, um, you begin to see an out-migration among white residents um, to the outlying suburbs and um, increased migration among African-Americans to the city. You also began to see uh, a declining uh, birth rate among white residents and also <clears throat> an increased uh, birth rate among African Americans. But it, it wasn't until, again, until um, the um, 50s that um, the school system became predominantly black and the 60s, um, the city as a whole became predominantly black. However, um, just kind of seeing I mean, a lot of the, the, the changes, the demographic shifts were in direct opposition to um, the increasing presence of African-Americans in, in these neighborhoods. And so one of the things that I kind of talk about um, in my work, um, this is not really just simply a story about education. This also has to do with changing politics and changing um, uh, power dynamics in the city um, to the extent that African Americans actually use the movement for ed- um, equality of education opportunity as a way to actually assert themselves and gain more power in a city overall, gain more power, gain more access to space in a city. And so, for for me, I mean, my 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 story kind of ends um, with Brown. In some ways, it is kind of ends as as a triumph. Um, to the extent that African Americans not only lay claim to this, this school system that once, you know, practiced separate but equal, but they also lay claim to this urban landscape. And so to actually come, you know, up through the last 10, 15 years and kind of witness things kind of op- um, operate in the reverse in some ways is I don't know. It, it, in many ways, I mean, it kind of speaks back to the um, the article that I wrote on Garnett Wilkinson, who actually he the thing that actually is happening in D.C. right now is the very thing that he sees. So that U Street corridor, which we know now um, has you know witnessed um, significant change, um, he actually feared that this is what integration would do. Um, African Americans would lose um, access to that space, and so to actually see that playing out in some ways is a bit disheartening, but because of what I know in terms of how cities change and how they evolve and that, you know, the city at one point was um, not, you know, exclusively black. Um, I mean, now we obviously have um, many more um, groups, you know, a large uh, Latin American presence in D.C. as well. You know, I think that it it's a, it's a complex, um, you know, it's a complex uh, story. It's a complicated debate. Um, but obviously that, that particular area around Howard, um, you know, it definitely, <laughs> um, I mean, like any of the other cities that I might have chosen, um, New York, I lived in Harlem, I witnessed gentrification there, I lived in Chicago, Brownsville, um, you know, these changes that are taking place nationwide. It's an unfortunate reminder of who holds, who really holds power um, in, this, in this country. And unfortunately, 
black people do not, by and large, collectively do not. And so these things are going to continue to happen. Um, those who hold, you know, power and authority over these um, spaces, they can decide when they want to leave and when they want to retake areas that they believe belong to them. And this is what we see happening, um, particularly around Howard. Thank you so much, Takia. Um, I just want to let us wrap up um, with you. Can you tell the listeners what's next for you, what you're working on, and how people can contact you if they're interested in learning more about your research? Sure. So I'm planning to complete my first um, academic book, um, this book on D.C., which has been um, a struggle um, because these stories are so complicated. Um, but I'm hoping to complete work for that. Um, and there are a number of other projects that I'm, I'm also hoping to move to. I mean, I, I would like to probably double back and, and do something that concerns um, African-American women's history because I have so much invested in, in that research. And then there also, um, I, I am um, have done a decent amount of writing um, public uh, for the, the larger public. And so I'm actually kind of looking to do more in that vein as well. Um, so long story short, I'm hoping to finish the first book, which will hopefully provide me with <laughs> motivation to, to to complete some of these other projects as well. And um, I should also mention that I do have my own developmental writing and editing business, which is tripleivy.com. And you can actually find me at tripleivy.com. Um, I help um, people in all um, genres of writing, uh, historical content development, editing. I do a lot of work with um, academics. Um, and I'm also available to speak on uh, a number of topics direct, directly related to my research, also research on Black women's, women's history, as well as my own professional experience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have so enjoyed talking to you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that for having me. Thank you to Takia K. Hamilton. Historians on Housewives would also like to thank Barbara and Mark Spear, Dr. Joaquin Galarza, Cody Baker, Molly Callahan, Courtney Crow, Lara Loper, Emerald Hill Interiors, Saddleback College, Christina Hinkle, Christina Gambapore, Judd Merlaski, and Pete Murray. Follow us at Historians H on Twitter and find us at historiansonhousewives.com. See you next time.